even in the best of times, our education system has struggled to keep up with the job market. But what we're seeing today increasingly is a quickening pace of change within that market. And so even a really well-aligned system would struggle. And it raises important questions about what, what are the changes that we need to see to have an education system that can ensure that we're producing um, learners who are prepared for, for careers. This is coming to be particularly important because in times past, there was always sort of an assumption that, hey, look, we don't necessarily need to get this stuff perfectly right because the reality is that people will figure this out over the course of a lifetime. Most people, the assumption was, are going to go through fairly verticalized um, uh, you know, tracks and over time are going to um, figure, they're going to just pick this stuff up along the way. Go from job to job and acquire skills. But the reality is that that's no longer the case. We're seeing jobs. What we're seeing today is what we're coming increasingly to call a hybrid job economy. Here's what we mean. Because increasingly, the jobs that are growing the fastest, that are of the highest value, that are hardest to fill, are jobs that are calling for people to be able to integrate a broad set of skills, not just relying on a single track. And often, these are skills that don't tend to get trained together. And so people are being called to synthesize, to wear a bunch of different hats, but those are hats that often don't fit on the same head. Just look at this example here of a mobile app developer. This is a job, when you look at the title of it, you'd say, OK, well, it's a developer job. There's nothing particularly hybrid about it. Burning Glass is very lucky to have a pretty unique view on the job market, because what we do is we pick up millions of job postings every day, and then we do the text analysis to translate them back to a common language. We can really understand what are those jobs about. When you look at those hundreds of thousands of mobile app developers in the past year, what we find is that increasingly those postings are not really just asking for development skills. Yes, there's that. But they, a lot of them are also asking for a bunch of other sets of skills um, which don't tend to ride together with programming skills. Some of that might be design skills, UI, UX skills, but even marketing skills. A lot of these jobs um, ask for people who are, have deep knowledge and expertise in e-commerce. Just to give a broader array of examples and to show how profound this impact is, you can see here um, just a few other examples of hybrid jobs. What you see is that the incredible pace of change in those jobs. You'll see jobs like these uh, mobile development jobs we talked about a minute ago have grown 140% over the course of the last five years. Uh, we've seen jobs like digital marketing, which have grown 145% in the last five years. Um, and these are jobs which, as you can see as well, these are not paying median income kind of jobs. Uh, we're seeing um, data analytics jobs with, a, with an average salary of $105,000, project management jobs paying $106,000. These are good jobs. And to give some perspective on this pace of growth, just to put it in relative terms here for a second, um, I want to compare the growth of hybrid jobs, these jobs that are bringing together different skill sets with the tech economy. Because normally we tend to think about the tech economy itself as being the high growth part of the job market. These hybrid jobs have grown seven and a half times faster than the tech economy over the last five years. There's now a quarter of a million of them in the last year. Um, this is coming to be um, a really big phenomenon and a really important one, and one whose importance is only just uh, beginning. We see this advent of the hybrid job economy in some ways as being the extension of a range of secular trends within the job market. We hear a lot of discourse about 
the, um, the coming of, of, of bots and how the bots are going to take over the job market. And in some ways, what we're seeing here is that trend start to play itself out. Um, you know, most of us, when we think about bots, we think about this sort of army of humanoid uh, machines who are sort of marching on to, to kick workers out of factories. But really what we're talking about is automation. And automation is nothing new. This is the extension and the quickening pace of a trend that's been going on for decades. And specifically, what we find is that automation impacts the kinds of tasks that are most repeatable. That's why we're seeing a significant decrease in opportunities at the middle skill level, the opportunities that, that have traditionally always been there for people without a college degree. Because those um, jobs often have a big chunks of them which are routine, and things that are routine a robot can take over. A robot has a lot harder time taking over and replicating human judgment of displaying the kind of cognitive skills that allow people to synthesize across. That core set of cognitive skills that now comprise a third of all job ads asking very specifically for cognitive skills is the bedrock of the hybrid job economy. So expecting that people have that judgment that provides the framework that allows people to acquire technical skills and bring those technical skills together. Another key secular trend revolves around the accessibility of technology. Because one of the things that we know is that it used to be, when we think about hybrid jobs overall, by the way, what we're really talking about in a lot of cases, I mean, yes, nominally we're talking about any combination of skills, but a large percentage of them are really about the infusing of traditional jobs with core technology. Sets of jobs that traditionally didn't involve technology today, um, those being a key that being a key requirement. What we're seeing today is that in a range of jobs, the technology skills have become a lot more accessible, a lot more democratic. It used to be that if you needed um, somebody who could do some analysis, you needed to turn somebody who had a deep stats background, and so those were specialists. If you needed um, a piece of code um, created, coding was a, a really hardcore set of skills that people needed to acquire, um, and those were, that was the domain of specialists. Today, it's not those technologies are a lot easier to master, the technology is more accessible, and so it's not unreasonable to expect that people in jobs like marketing and finance and operations have analytical skills, have data skills, have programming skills. But that creates a challenge. Our existing system, on the other hand, is oriented around providing um, a set of foundational skills and expects that people are going to move, as we showed before, in that sort of straight line through their careers. So, hey, we don't need to think about the technical skills that people acquire. Because jobs, yes, jobs change, but they change over a period of time. The reality is, is that jobs are changing very fast, as you've seen. And so it becomes really important that people have the mechanism to pick up the right skills along the way. And we need an infrastructure for that. Just a thought exercise. I want to imagine for a second that we had a crystal ball when it came to the job market. And then we had a way that was, we didn't have the kind of encumbrances to programs being well adapted, um, the accreditation problems, the, the challenges that a tenured faculty provide. And let's assume, in this case, that five years ago, somebody could have foretold that fourfold growth that was going to happen in data analytics jobs. Because back then, there weren't a lot of programs in data analysis. Here's the problem. Even if those programs, someone could, could have predicted it, those programs were there. The data analytics jobs of today are not the data analytics jobs of five years ago. Um, so would have wound up graduating people, come out of that long pipe of higher education, and they wouldn't have been prepared in any case. Um, give a, another example of that. We know that the, the job market has always been buffeted by 
um, a range of externalities. And those externalities can have a very significant impact in terms of the, the business cycle, in terms of what kinds of jobs are there and are not. Five years ago, undergraduates were piling into geology programs, petrochemical engineering programs, because there was an expectation you were going to come out and you were going to step right into a six-figure job. How'd that work out for them? When you've got a hybrid education job, when you've got a rather a traditional education job market that is, or, or as education system, that says we're going to put students through a long pipe, even where that pipe is theoretically career directed, um, you can wind up with significant disjoints at the end. I talked a minute ago about those data analytics jobs, and I want to come back to them for a second because the kind of pace of growth that they've undertaken is so profound and is so illustrative of the challenge for us here and of what it means to try to keep up, what it means to have the right infrastructure. Because at the same time that those jobs have grown fourfold, where I told you that those jobs changed a lot, one of the things that's been very interesting to watch is that the sets of skills that those jobs asked for five years ago were predominantly quant skills. Today, even as those jobs have grown fourfold, the demand for data visualization skills within those jobs has grown 25-fold. The demand for key infrastructure skills has grown eight to 10-fold. So the nature of what those jobs are has changed. And when those jobs are changing intrinsically again, we need to make sure we have a mechanism for people to acquire skills and acquire the right skills. Acquiring the right skills is absolutely crucial. We recently said, let's just understand this advent of coding skills and the proliferation of the demand for coding skills across an array of occupations that didn't typically used to require coding skills. And we just said, let's take the whole spectrum of jobs that are out there and let's break them out into earning quartiles. On the left, you're seeing those bottom quartile jobs. You can imagine not a lot of them, in fact, none of them, typically requires coding skills. But as you move across the income quartiles, you find by the time you get to that top quartile of jobs, literally half of all jobs, of top earning jobs, um, are in occupations that not infrequently are asking for coding skills. So, if we don't provide students with those technical skills and the right technical skills, students don't have a chance to land a well-earning career in the 21st century. This is the ticket that we owe it to provide students with. So on the one hand, we know that those technical skills are really important. But on the other hand, we also know that employers are really hard pressed to find the foundational skills as well. And so um, here we did a, did a bunch of analysis around not only tracking the demand for foundational skills, and by the way, one in three skills that employers ask for is a foundational skill. But what we found was that employers ask for very specific skills based on the type of job, and they perceive gaps and different gaps based upon the type of job. So it's important not only that we're providing um, foundational skills for our hybrid job market, but that we are providing the right titration of those skills. We're providing the right skills depending on the job we're training people for. So on the one hand, we've got this argument that says, hey, look, we need to make sure in this big mandate that says we need to make sure that students are acquiring technical skills. On the other side, we're saying we actually really need those foundational skills. It's not a disjoint. It's not an either or. What employers are saying is they need both. Here what you're seeing is the demand for jobs that require creativity skills. I wanted to pick on this one because a lot of students go into jobs um, and say, hey, look, I'm a creative type. I don't need to learn STEM skills. These are the skills that employers ask for 
in jobs where the employers are emphasizing creativity. Those aren't soft skills. Those are a set of programming skills, a set of design skills, a set of business skills, and the list goes on from there. Um, so it's not enough to have those foundations. We also need to make sure that we have a mechanism for providing students with the technical skills at the point they graduate and along the way. That represents a significant challenge for higher ed because, yes, that core foundational skill framework that liberal arts programs provide is important, but we also need to make sure that the technical skills are there and that there is a way for people to stay up to date. That challenge is an opportunity. And there's a range of folks who are stepping in to fill that vacuum, some of them non-traditional, and we'll come and give you a few examples there, and then move um, at the end to talk about the opportunities for traditional um, higher education institutions as well. Um, whether those in non-traditional, those are boot camps, those are online providers, those are certification issuers, I'll give you some examples of each of those. First example I'll give is, is of General Assembly, um, which has been um, very progressive in their use of real-time data about the job market to be able to identify the white spaces, to make sure that they're in the market where um, employers aren't getting what they need make sure that they have a means of creating programs that are highly targeted for specific job market opportunities city by city. What are those skills? What are those opportunities? How do we teach them? How do we make sure that students are acquiring the specific skills that they need in order to get those opportunities and to create that most efficient bundle? And here's just an example of somebody who might be trying to move from a web development job to a UI UX job and the set of skills that they might need. This is an opportunity as well for certification issuers. There's a lot of discussion around certifications and assessments. I mean, it's important to understand within a hybrid job economy where we need people to be able to step in and acquire skills along the way, how we can validate those skills. And there's some places where certifications are working well. It's important to understand what those are, and there's some places where certifications are struggling, and we'll talk about those in a second. First, where they're working. We broke out those certifications that seem to have currency into three core buckets. First, a set of certifications that serve to open the door, where a lot of entry-level jobs are asking for those certifications, and where there's a salary premium at the entry level, but typically at the entry level only. Those jobs, once you, they start asking for a lot of experience, um, are no longer providing a premium for those skills. So these help people make a career change into a skill. And these are things like ASW, welding skill, uh, sort of certification rather, A plus help desk certification. You've got things like career advancer certifications. So for people in a given area to demonstrate that they're ready, that they've acquired the competences that were required to take the next step. Last year there was demand for 49,000, uh, there was 49,000 job postings that asked for CISSP certification, which is an entry-level cybersecurity certification. It takes five years of experience to get one. There was a national population of 65,000 people to serve those 49,000 um, job postings. So a tremendous demand um, that well outstrips supply. How do we make sure we can validate that people have the uh, skill to take that next step? And increasingly as well, we see opportunity for array, an array of badges to just validate that people have acquired specific skills that in turn provide a salary premium. Acquiring a skill like Android development skill, Hadoop skills can, acquire, can produce a 22% salary premium. And here's just an example of that. See, for example, a recruiter who's making $21 an hour can acquire um, PHR certification um, and move up um, almost a 75% jump in salary on average. Um, and you see an array of opportunities where acquiring a certification really does make a difference. But there's a cautionary note here. Overall, we track demand for something like 6,000 certifications. Overall, about 15 to 20% of all jobs ask for some kind of certification. But of those several thousand certifications that are out there, 90% of all jobs that ask for a certification ask for one of the top 200. There is a huge long tail of certifications that have yet to acquire any 
market currency. So before we go in and say, hey, how do we create more certifications? How do we um, certify various skill sets um, that are key to the hybrid economy? We need to figure out why certain certifications acquire currency and why others don't. I want to move to give you some illustrations for the opportunities around the world of higher education itself. This is an example um, of Northeastern University, which has been uh, using an awareness of the job market and the skills that employers are looking for to create an array of specialized master's programs that are um, very closely aligned with the local job market. And those programs have proved to be a big success for Northeastern. Here's one example. Northeastern would not have needed much data to be able to know that there's a lot of biotech companies in the, their, the area of their core Boston campus. You wouldn't have needed a lot of data to say that those guys are hiring a lot of biologists and chemists. But it turns out when you sort of dig into it and when you can aggregate up the vocabulary of jobs, what you find is that a lot of those jobs are in um, regulatory fields, essentially regulatory project managers who can manage compounds through all phases of development. A lot of demand, hard for employers to fill, and you know, what you find is that uh, they are high-level jobs. And so Northeastern created a master's program in regulatory affairs. It has been a tremendous um, success for them, and they've done that now um, across many other opportunities. And not only have they used that to identify where the programs are, but what is it that you need to teach? What are the things which those jobs, uh, those employers, who are those employers and what do they ask for in those jobs? What's the skill sets and how do you create a program that's specifically aligned for the array of skills? And here you're seeing regulatory affairs on the one side, but understanding of drug development and drug development processes in the other. Again, hybrid jobs. There's an opportunity here as well for the liberal arts, traditional liberal arts as well. We tend to cast this debate about career-oriented education in either or, baby or bathwater terms. Looked at the demand for, liberal art, for, for jobs for liberal arts graduates. What are the jobs that really sort of require nothing else aside from a college degree? Overall, about a million of them a year. When you pair out all the jobs that require some specialized training, nursing, engineering, whatever it is. We then said, Let's look for, let's just pick out eight sets of skills that we thought, you know, people could acquire these skills on the peripheries of their education, whether in non-departmental courses, whether in internships, online courses, whatever it may be. Those incremental, if you acquire one of those eight incremental skills, it doubles the number of job opportunities from a million to almost two million. And those incremental opportunities pay significantly more. Um, and what you see here, just a few examples of those skills, and just acquiring is just one example here. Um, social media skills for a recent college graduate opens up 400,000 additional jobs. Um, acquiring graphic design skills, um, not hard skills to master, 135,000 incremental jobs, and they pay a lot more. The key to this is making sure that we have a mechanism for making sure that we are helping students acquire those um, supplementary skills and those supplementary experiences, and we have a way of helping them see where they can do that effectively. I just want to give you one example and leave you with this. I'm going to think about a liberal arts college and somebody in, in a liberal arts major, let's say an anthropology major, and they say, well, you know, I'm thinking about a career in HR. How do I prepare for that? School says, well, we're a liberal arts college. We don't have HR courses. They've got a sociology class in organizational theory, a political science class in survey research, a history of labor relations, a basic stats course. You have that set of skills. You're well prepared for an HR career um, and for a set of increased job opportunities. So this is really about how do we create that signal both for the student to know where, what non-deportmental courses to add and how we flag that for employers to understand that, wait a second, yes, the degree says anthropology, but this is somebody who's really well prepared. There's a path forward to the hybrid job market. We need to ensure that students 
have the foundational skills they need. But we also need to make sure that students have a roadmap of where they're going and what they need to learn to get there. And they have an infrastructure for acquiring the technical skills, not just at the point of graduation, but along the way. That will lead to a, a very significant amount of opportunity that can be tapped. It's time for us to recognize that jobs are like supernovas. They're born, they shine, and they die. They change all the time. We need an educational system that provides that kind of, that's oriented around the dynamic job market and that makes sure that people have their way and can find their way to the next star. Thank you so much. Really enjoyed speaking with you. I'd be glad to stay afterwards for questions.